Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023. We are in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 5, and we'll start at verse 5. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You will not get in here. Even the blind and lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. And that's why they said, The blind and lame will not enter the palace. David wastes no time. He has been ruling in Hebron, which is one of the larger cities in Judah. But he knows that it's not a proper capital for the whole country of Israel. He's seen Gibeah and Saul rule from there. He's seen some of the other cities, and he knows that they have deficiencies. Jerusalem is the ideal site. It is the top of a bunch of hills on the edge of a plateau. You can see the countryside far around. It is actually the highest place in the southern half of Israel, and even the plateau uh, slopes down away from it. You can see into the Araba, the Jordan Valley. You can see down to Jericho. You can see down to the Mediterranean Sea. And it is an ideal place. It's hard to attack. It Even then, it was well fortified. It has one problem. The Jebusites are living there. Now, Joshua conquered Jerusalem and forced the Jebusites out. And twice in the Judges, we've seen that they conquer, reconquered Jerusalem and forced the Jebusites out. But the Jebusites have been stubborn in coming back and regaining their city. And it is their capital city. It is the place they consider home. And in fact, David will not manage to rule it until he does what God told Moses to do and Joshua to do, is wipe the Jebusites out. And he goes up to it with his army, and he knows the city well. It's not mentioned here, but he has been a shepherd. Jerusalem was a major market town. It was one of the larger cities within the territory that was Judah. It was not Israelite territory because the Jebusites had it. But it would have been a place to do commerce. He would have probably gone there to sell wool and buy other supplies. And he has seen the city. He knows something about it. He may have, when he was on the running from Saul, been by to visit it and see it. And begin to think of it in terms of a military man. And what would it take to conquer this? And he knows he wants the city. He knows that it's very defendable but it's going to be hard to take. And he's thought up this plan. God is with him. And he tells his men they're going to have to attack through the water shaft. There is a, uh, was a, either a drain or a, uh, aqueduct that watered the city in. And he knows it's the weakness and that's where they're going to attack through. The Jebusites are arrogant. They think their fortress is invulnerable, that they have made it such that they don't have to have good soldiers there. And they know who David is. They know he's a good military man. But they're arrogant, and they tell him even the blind and the lame, those who are in not fit for battle, can defend the city. They uh, are trusting in their physical defenses and not in a good army. And um, David has already thought that through and figured out how to defeat them. And apparently they go up the uh, water shaft and invade the city and conquer it. And since never again the Jebusites controlled the city, he probably did what God had told Moses and Joshua to do and wipe the Jebusites out. We never hear them again. And 
he then, you know, he sets up his palace there. He uses the facilities that are there. Verse 9. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward, and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. So once he conquers Jerusalem and he has the fortress, he starts living there. And as a good king does, he built up defenses. And he, from basically the walled area of the city, he built it up and built a city within it so that uh, he had a not just a palace, not just a fortification, a castle. He had a walled city that was his governing place. And we know that the part that he built walls and supporting terraces and the city of is uh, the old quarter now. It is a small part of the city of Jerusalem. And even in the Roman times, it was a small part of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they had built further walls and more walls. And in fact, as we read through Second Samuel, we'll find that Solomon built more walls and etc. When we get to kings, other kings in Israel and Judah build walls further out. And the city gets expanded. And it becomes the great metropolis that it is today. Uh, several times in history, it's been a great metropolis. At this point in time, it's not yet become a metropolis. David starts that process. And during his reign, apparently, it became a metropolis. And Solomon recognized the weakness of having a metropolis outside the walls of your city. And so he builds walls around the city that's become and greatly expands the city. <clears throat> David takes over the city as it is and essentially turns the old part of the city in his day into a castle and then builds a walled city around that to become the city of Jerusalem. And he knows in his heart that God has made him king. And that God has made him king for a reason. And that uh, he is powerful because God has made him powerful. Verse 11. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Now Hiram was from Tyre. Tyre was down the coast. They controlled Lebanon. They, they did not control all of Lebanon. The, Lebanon was controlled by other, had other factions also in it, kind of like Israel did. But it was the kingdom just north of Israel. And Hiram is a fairly wise man. He understands that David is going to be a strong king, that he's a strong military leader, and that he is doing important things. And he probably thinks, i got to have this guy as an ally because if he's my enemy on my south side, I'm in trouble. And he doesn't just send ambassadors. Hiram is a builder. He was a builder. He built Tyre. He had built it up. It had been a city before, and it had been a walled city, but he had built it up into a major metropolis himself, and he had stonemasons and carpenters, and he had the ability to build a castle, and he didn't just send an ambassador. He sent materials and the people it took to build a castle and says, here, I'm going to give you a gift. Let me build you a castle. You're going to be a powerful king. Let's have this good working relationship, and I'm going to give you this gift. And this obviously is obvious to David that God has made him king and made him powerful to serve the people. And that other kings are doing him the honor 
of building a castle. I mean, it's it, that's not a cheap gift. That's a, that's an expensive gift. And he and Hiram become friends. They rule neighboring kingdoms. They build each other up. And, um, you know, they have, during their lifetime, a good working relationship. And David is there to serve the people of Israel as king. Verse 13. After he left Hebron, Hebron, David took up more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. These are the names of the children born to him there. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphaz. So, he has more sons born. By the way, this translation is very poor. It says, the, these are the children, and they're all male names. These are his sons that were born there. It mentions those other daughters born. They don't get named. In fact, only one of his daughters gets named in Scripture. And we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, she is an important part of the story because of what happens to her. But just the culture of the time, women didn't get named unless they were wives of important men. And then if the man was important enough, his wives got mentioned too. Or if they played a significant part of the story, such as the one daughter that, of David's that gets named, most of them don't get mentioned you'll notice their mothers weren't mentioned here in this list. The, and this is, I'm going to point out here, this is not chronology. From a Western mind, this is kind of a weird, because we know from later some of the story, some of these boys were born much later. This story was written well after David's time, or written down afterwards, and they are summarizing things here. They, he's crowned king. He conquers his city, Jerusalem. And here's everybody that was born there. But before he conquers Jerusalem, we have this list of, um, you know, all of his sons that were born in Hebrew. And um, so... His story is told thematically, not chronologically. And that's going to be important because the rest of this chapter, he's dealing with the Philistines. And when we, for them, the first words there indicate that they came and attacked before he built Jerusalem. He probably conquered Jerusalem. And that's probably what brought to their attention that he was now king of Israel, not just king of Judah. And when they learn that he's king of all Israel, they're, they're scared, and so they attack. And that probably happens shortly after he conquers Jerusalem, and he has to go out and deal with that, and then he comes back and builds up, and he knows the enemy, and he realizes the need to build Jerusalem. And probably then Hiram sends men to build a castle. And it takes a while to build a castle. This week, uh, one part of my research, I watched a YouTube on how to build a 13th century castle. And a set of archaeologists that's done a lot of extensive work in Europe on how castles were built decided to experimentally try to see could they use the techniques of 13th century Europe and build a castle. And so they had built a mill, they milled their own grain, they built a blacksmith shop and made their own tools to be just like the tools that a 13th century castle builder would have. They cut down lumber 
they mined stone, they built castle walls, they did the whole thing. And a fairly small group of people built a, about a four acre castle to, to show that you could do it. And they are, you know, imitating <clears throat> castle life. And uh, it was a fascinating uh, film. Title was somewhat deceptive, uh, something like uh, Why Medieval People Thought Blacksmiths Were Magic, or something like that. And that was one line in the middle of this, I don't know, an hour or so video uh, that was kind of an aside to the whole thing. But it was, you know, interesting. And they, at the point the film was made, they had spent 13 years making the castle. They have the outer walls done. They have a few little buildings on the inside. Uh, they're still building the ramparts and the uh, stuff, but they're beginning to get the uh, uh, insides of the castle lined out. Uh, they have the kitchen made. They have the uh, mill made and things like that, they do not uh, have it anywhere near complete yet. But a fairly small group of people uh, was building, and uh, it was over one story high at this point in time, and, you know, had a defensible spot from the technologies of the day. Obviously, technologies today, it's just a nice large stone building, but... Um, so, you know, Hiram could have easily built it, but he wasn't uh, sending enough people to build it. But it was not a, you know, two or three week process. I'm walking around Benbrook, picking up litter, and y'all know that. I am watching construction in a certain area of Benbrook. They have taken about a year to get the streets laid down. And last month when I walked through an area that I knew had sold all the lots, they were working on the dirt work, trying to shape the hill. It had been a sloping hill, and they were digging dirt out and contouring it. When I walked this month through it, all the you could see every lot and the uh, contour of the land. They had put built retaining walls, and the first house had a foundation and had been framed in. That is the speed of building. I'm sure next month when I go by, it will be weathered in, and the plumbing will be in, and electricity will be in, and they'll be doing finishing work, and probably have other foundations laid, and, you know, probably by April, somebody will be living in that neighborhood. From, you know, dirt to people living in it, three months. That, that's the speed we build at today. And to, in one sense, that's amazingly fast. And yet, that day and time, the technologies they had, it would have probably taken years to build the palace, the castle that Hiram built for him. So they're summarizing here. It is not chronological, it is topical. Yes, in a general sense, it's chronological. He gets crowned king, he conquers Jerusalem, he sets up the government there, the Philistines attack. Yes, but a lot of the things that get mentioned here take a lot longer than that. In our Western mind, we're thinking, oh, you know, Within six months, he has the palace and the everything built, and he's built the walls and the uh, city within, and the government's moved there and set up. No, it probably took decades to get all that done, and the government grew in the process, and he kept building to accommodate the needs of the growing government and what he had envisioned as a city around his uh, fortress, that he would defend and have trade in becomes a government center and the city grows around the walls 
because commerce needs to happen near the government. And likewise, all those sons were not born quickly. He does acquire more wives. He does acquire more concubines. And they're very honest about it. Some of these women weren't formally married to him. And he had sex with them. He had children by them. He acknowledged that they were his children. They would have an inheritance, but they wouldn't be in line for the throne. The women themselves uh, only had gifts while he was alive. Once he was dead, they would have no... If they didn't own it already, they would have no part of his inheritance. The children they had would not have an inheritance unless he specifically named them to have one, and only what he named them to be. They didn't have full rights of being a wife, or full rights. But on the other hand, uh, they got a chance to be with somebody that was very powerful and have that social status of, I'm his woman. They also did have to, in many senses, have the restraints a wife would have to have. They couldn't go play the crowd. They had to stay faithful to him, even though he was not going to be faithful to them. And uh, like a lot of things, being concubine was not all it was cracked up to be. It was there for fun, but the men had to take responsibility for their children and their women. But they didn't live in the house with him. He did take other wives, and we do later learn some of the names. Verse 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him, but David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now, this probably may have even happened before he conquered Jerusalem. When they heard he had been anointed king over all Israel, they went up in full force. So they're probably coming to Hebron. It's not a well... It's not... Well, it's a, it's a walled city, and it's able to be defended, but it's not as good as Jerusalem. And it's closer to their territory. So he sees weaknesses militarily. And his first response is go into the stronghold that's in Hebron and play defensive. But it's not a great stronghold. Verse 18. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephim. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord answered him, Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to Baal Perizim, where he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So the place is called Baal Perizim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. So he went down to the stronghold, but in the stronghold, he did what he was supposed to do. He consulted God. He asked for the priest, and he asked questions of God, and God gave him an answer. Yes, you're supposed to attack the Philistines. I will definitely hand them over to you. And so he goes and attacks, and he wins the battle, and the Philistines flee. In fact, they flee in such a hurry that they abandon everything that isn't important for life and death right now. And they end up with leaving all their idols behind. Now, the implication is the idols are valuable. They're either made of metal, silver, and gold, bronze, brass, things like that or their precious stones. Um, and Israel captures them. There's two parts to that. One, if they were valuable like silver, gold, or brass or bronze, they have gotten wealth. 
But the other thing that the Philistines are going to see is Israelites' God is strong enough that Israelites can capture their gods. Since they thought the God was in the idol, the Israelites were stronger than their gods. This is going to dishearten the Philistines, and it, it's quite true in a literal sense, since their idols weren't gods at all, that the Israelites were stronger than their gods. The Israelites, being alive, beat a dead idol. However, God is also sending the message to the Israelites that I am stronger than the Philistine gods. I told you what to do, you did it, and you win. And you're doing what I told you to do. You're supposed to be driving these people out of the land, conquering them, and you won the battle because you did what I told you to. And David has gotten in the habit of consulting God before he goes to battle and seeing what does he need to do. We didn't see that when he conquered Jerusalem, but apparently he does consult God, and God tells him the answer how to do it, and he tells the man how to do it, and it works that way. And now the Philistines have come out to battle. They get defeated. They run home. The Israelites walk off with booty. We know from later history, they do not worship these idols. They recognize them as wealth. They use them for materials, whether that's gold or silver or brass or bronze or you know, precious stones or whatever. If it's wood, they have some campfire wood. They, the Israelites are worshiping Yahweh because David is insisting on it. He is saying, Yahweh has made me a great king. I'm winning because of Yahweh. We're going to worship Yahweh. And we're stronger than their gods. We can take their gods. But we have the materials from it. They're not really gods. Don't worry about the gods. Do what you want to with it. You know, if it's gold, melt it down and make coins. If it's silver, melt it down and make jewelry. If it's brass or bronze, melt it down and make swords and spears and, you know, etc. So, he, you know, conquers them. And they named the place Baal Perizim because the, he says, uh, you know, may, as the waters break out, may the God break out against my enemies. Uh, Perizim is a flood. It's a God flood. They named the place God flood, basically that God flooded against the Baals, and they conquered them. It's a good bit, bit of naming, poetic. Verse 22. Once more the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rephim. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, Do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, Move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you, to, of you to strike the Philistine army. So D David did as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. And an alternate reading of that says Gibeah. Uh, a, probably Gezer, because that is a Philistine city. But we'll get back to that in a minute. It's probably a year later. The way that wars in that day and time worked, there was a time in the spring after you planted and before you had to harvest. It was late spring. There was agricultural activities in early spring and mid-spring, and then there's this kind of pause point in late spring before the summer starts where... There's not much to do, and that's the time you have manpower available, and you can call up everybody and put them in the army and go attack. And then summer starts, and you have summer activities, uh, beginning to ha harvest vegetables and things like that, 
and you start getting labor needing to be used on the farms, and it's time to be back home. And so then they went back home, and they continued their agricultural activities, and then it became har harvest season for grains and other things, and they harvested and they put the crops in, and then there was a pause point in the fall in which most cultures in that time celebrated, and then the winter came, and it was time to do the maintenance work and stay indoors as much as you could, and then as soon as it got pleasant uh, after the winter, it was time to plow and plant and agricultural things, and so wartime was in the spring. It would be later that professional armies and nations got big enough that you could have a standing army that could go do military things, important military things, at other times of years of the year. Even then, very often they didn't they did most of their military campaign in the spring when they could have their supporting troops come off the farm and, you know guard supplies and guard the supply routes and make sure that wagon loads of supplies got to the army out on the front and back and things like that. Uh, the So the time of war was in the spring and if you, you didn't attack, you didn't pull up your whole army at other times of year unless it was just desperate circumstances, like somebody was foolish enough to attack during harvest season. Well, then you obviously went out and defended, but you risk losing your crop in the field because they attacked during harvest season. Of course, they also risk not getting the harvest there because they'd marched for a while. So it just didn't happen much. And so it's probably a year later that the Philistines come and attack again. And David inquires the Lord again, should I attack them? And God says, don't do it the way you did it last time. Go make an ambush behind them, and I'll give you this key, that I'll perform this minor miracle of sounding like marching troops in the top of the balsam tree. You'd be hiding under the uh, little forest there, in the wood there, and when you hear sounds like marching in the top of the trees, then attack because that's going to be the right time. And so God gives him this signal, and he goes around, brings his army behind the Philistine army to attack from the rear, which is probably a good military strategy, just not something David's thought of yet. And the Philistines aren't expecting to be attacked from the rear. And then when God makes the sound on the top of the trees, they attack. Of course, that becomes a surprise attack. The Philistines are expecting an attack on the front of their army. They have prepared to defend the front. They have probably thought about David's strategy and figured out how to solve the problems from last year. And David is using a new strategy. And he attacks from the rear of their camp and conquers them again. And this is only two of the battles he has that uh, uh, is mentioned. He probably fights them essentially every spring. They're probably for a while attempting to get their territory back. But David is in the process whittling them down and gaining territory for Israel. He's defending against other countries He's attacking other countries, and so uh, we'll learn about that. But um, he has a very great victory that day, and he at, not only kills the Philistines on the battlefield, they begin running, and they run north through Benjamin, and then back west toward the Mediterranean, and then back south toward Philistia, and he chases them the whole time. So they have marched north out of Philistia. He comes around behind the south of them, attacks them, 
they run north through Judah, through Benjamin, and he strikes them down, he kills them. They make a corner at Gibeah where Saul used to make his stand. And it's somewhat ter familiar territory. There used to be fighting fights there. And they're fighting a whole lot closer to their territory. And they then have to take the long way home. And his army chases them the whole time. And they kill them all the way to Gezer, which is the northwesternmost city in Philistia. So they finally make it home, going long roundabout route, running the whole time, being slaughtered the whole time, and David is, and his men are winning the battle. And this is a description of how effective David is as a military leader. So he begins to get the whole countryside safe. The Philistines are no longer a major threat to, to Israel. They, the politics of it is such that Saul has beat them back some and made it a single country. There was, for seven years, internal struggle over who would be king, uh, a low-grade civil war, not really a war per se. Their armies didn't face up against each other. But now that David is clearly king, he's organized the country, the Philistines come out to fight him. He wins the first battle. A year later, the second battle, he uses a different strategy, and he defeats them much more severely this time. First time, he gains wealth. The second time, he defeats them soundly, that they have to go running the long way. And his men are killing the army the whole time. And uh, this is the last we see them trying to invade Israel. After that, David is on the offensive, attacking them, attacking the other countries. And this is the last time they invade. Other, other countries will try things, but David has successfully defended the country. And it's not just he won a battle and he's kept the border secure. He's moved the border south down to almost where Moses told him the border should be. There's a little strip of Philistia left. He hasn't ma made the border all the way to the brook of Egypt where Moses told him to, to, to their territory would be to. But if you look at the map where that is, Moses has basically told him that desert we wandered around in, that's Israelite territory. And they go from there to invading the land. So it becomes a different king, a different time to conquer all the way down there. And um, kind of inter interesting historical note, the border, the southern border of Israel today is where Moses said the southern border would be. An interesting note. God is still fulfilling the promise he made through Moses. Now, their territory has not been uh, all the way to the upper end yet, to the northern end, that Moses sold them. David does conquer up to there, but and Solomon rules it, but he rules it as vassal states, as kingdoms that bring him tribute. It's not Israelite territory, per se. Uh, it, that will That is yet to be fulfilled. The, some of the other prophets say that that will happen, and we haven't seen it yet. It's interesting to, to read it and look at the map and understand what vast area is going to be Israel that God has promised, and that God said through Moses, you should do this and you should conquer it. And it's not yet happened. I think it will still yet happen. But uh, a lot of history is going to happen between now and that time. And I'm not going to even try to predict future history. 
but David is beginning to do what he needs to do as king to be uh, the king of country. He's acting king-like. He's defending the country. He's conquering territory. He's running the people out that shouldn't be out. He's uh, removing the people from the earth that God said to remove. And uh, the next uh, few chapters, we're going to deal with that and how he uh, deals with it and how he leads the people to worship Yahweh. He has been dependent upon Yahweh. We've seen that time and time again. He consults the priest. He asks God, should I attack this way? And sometimes he gets, yes, and go, go and I'll hand them to you. And he does. Sometimes God says, don't do it the same way you did it last time. March around behind them or set up an ambush, or, or and we're going to see God, Moses, I mean, David, excuse me, continues to consult God, and continues to get battle lessons, and general lessons, of how to be a great military leader, time and time again. He, he also learns those lessons, and teaches them to his generals, and we're going to see later, those generals then, use those, Lessons God's been teaching David to just lead the army to go do it. But they're doing it at God's command through Moses, through Joshua. It's been 400 years roughly, and they still haven't completely conquered the land. But David is beginning to get that process finalized, and he makes it one nation, not a loose confederation of tribes that largely control the land, but things like the Jebusites still have their city, J Jerusalem. And over here we have this little enclave of Hittites, and over there we have... No. David conquers, and it's one continuous territory. And he holds the borders, and he advances the borders, and he engages enemies not just as they enter the land, but on their own territory and win. And this is the beginning of that story. First, he conquers his capital. He's got to get Jerusalem. Next, the Philistines are after him. They know David. They know he's a strong leader. If they don't get him quickly, he's going to become dominant. And they, they see that this is... We kind of got to do a last-ditch, last-stand here our history, and they do, and they lose, and they come back the next year and goes, we got to do it again, they improve their strategy, but David is a wily man, and not only is he using his own wisdom, he's depending upon God, and so he's asking God's wisdom, and he's getting answers from God, and God knows the Philistine weakness, they're looking at how he win the last war. David's advancing to the next war. And so David wins again. Holy Father, have us to depend upon you like David did, that we would continually come and seek your face and get wisdom from you, that we would choose the wise path, not, uh, as Oscar said this morning, the foolish path, but folly. Um, folly looks good sometimes, but... Uh, it looks like it's an easier path to the same point, but it's not. Lord, have us to depend upon you, to trust you, to seek your face, to read your word and understand it and apply our minds and put effort into understanding you, to studying your word and to living the way you say to live. Have us to understand that when we do that, you will advance your kingdom and you will bless us. Lord, our country is so desperate for your moving your fierce Holy Spirit again. I ask that you change your people, that the people who are called by your name, the Christians, would humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked way, and that, that your Holy Spirit then would draw those who aren't yours that they would understand the difference between 
truth and righteousness and falsehood and evil and that they would turn and repent and follow you. That your spirit would run through this land drawing people back to yourself. That you would heal the ills of this land because we, your people, would obey you again. In your holy name, amen. This has been your host, uh, Frank Reich. I am Associate Pastor of Family and Ministry at Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. And today is Sunday, February 19th, 2023. Uh, Oscar preached a good sermon, and he has one more in at a, uh, Proverbs uh, on wisdom. Okay. I hope to see you Wednesday evening at the Bible study. If not, I hope to see you uh, next Sunday at church. And um, you, you never know. I mean, Oscar mentioned this morning, sure, you can watch it on on YouTube and um, watch television, tell that church, but do you get the full experience? No, you don't. We had an interesting visitor today, and if you weren't there, you didn't get to meet this wonderful lady and um, didn't have that experience. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, show up every week because uh, being there in person, meeting people face to face, meeting everybody that shows up face to face is much better than doing it online. I understand there are times and places and people that are ill or whatever and have to see it online. And you may be out of town or whatever, and experiencing it secondhand on a video is better than not at all. But face-to-face -face is so much better. I hope to see you there Wednesday, and if not, we'll see you on YouTube. Have a blessed week.